I'm Irena Sunakoje, and I'm delighted to be moderating this conversation with author Morgan Tolte on behalf of Off the Shelf Festival. Morgan joins us to talk about his brilliant new novel, Fire Essex, as well as his career as an author so far. I'd like to introduce him without further ado. Morgan Tolte, a citizen of the Penobscot Indian Nation, is the author of the best selling, award winning, and critically acclaimed story collection, Night of the Living Res. He is an assistant professor of English in creative writing and Native American and contemporary literature at the University of Maine, Orono. He lives in Levant, Maine. Morgan, welcome and a huge congratulations on this novel, Fire Exit. It's exquisite. Um, it's a novel that explores familial legacies, kinship, the relationship between fathers and daughters, family secrets, and the kind of weight of that, but also the longing of, of wanting to connect to a loved one and being at a distance from them. And I found it really just such a, a deeply emotive and profound read. Um, I wanted to ask what your intentions were with this book um, and why it was important to tell this story. Thank you for having me. Um... Festival off the shelf for having me and thank you, Ernison, for having me, um, you know, talking with me and 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 loving the book as much as you have. Uh, I'm a fan of your work as well. Uh, oh. Surprisingly. <laughs> yeah, very. Yeah, very much. Thank so. you so much. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the intention behind the book, you know, it's interesting as a fiction writer, you know, I I usually don't have an intention until I like find it. You know, I feel like we're all constrained by how we're supposed to act and behave in society, right? In these like spaces, you know, invisible boundaries versus and or real boundaries, right? And it's like when I start to write, I begin to kind of come out of that mm. place. And I'm like, oh, we have some real issues in these boundaries about how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to behave, how systems are structured. And it's in drafting and revising that I kind of find the intention. I knew from the very beginning, though, that the book was going to deal with blood quantum. Um, believe it or not, kind of like the whole engine of the book, like just came to me very quickly, like, like it just did. Um, but that was the easiest part. The rest of it, the writing it, you know, and all of that was the hard stuff. But it was in 2015 where I was like thinking about Louise Erdrich's novel, The Roundhouse, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, deals with a court case that strip tribes of their inherent sovereignty to prosecute non-natives who commit crimes um, on Indian uh land or land held or reservations or you know in those territories and uh, the book isn't it's about that but it's about the characters right and how they're dealing with the trauma of what had happened to the main character Geraldine who was a victim of of rape and mm -hmm. um so I was as an indigenous person you know I was like I wonder what I can look to in federal Indian law and its history to 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 find a hypothetical situation that could happen, whereas mm -hmm. Erdrix wasn't hypothetical. It, it had happened, and it's still happening, the rates of violence against Native women. And I was um, thinking, I was like, well, what if a non-Native person grew up on the reservation and, you know, from a very young age had been part of it and, you know, grew up with this girl who was he was friends with, and this other guy, Gizus, um, another good friend. And but what if he and the woman end up having, you know, a, a a baby, you know, after he leaves the reservation, and she's only twenty five percent Penobscot, so blood quantum, you know, that's the eligibility for Penobscot people. At least all tribes have their own, and. Uh, for them, it would be that the child wouldn't be considered Penobscot technically. It'd be right. She'd be considered a descendant, um, so not really a citizen, but gets a little bit of things, rights, and stuff until a certain age. And then, what if she lied and said the child belonged to somebody else? And I was like, 
Now that's fascinating. And then I didn't write it into two years later, you know, the first draft. And it was in that first draft that I began to just kind of not really deal with the question, but deal with the characters and who they were like. By the final two rewrites I did was when I like, the intention was clear. The intention was that there was a, I found a blue, it was almost like a blueprint. And I haven't, I feel can I feel free to say it now <laughs> there's a blue because I was talking with Karen Russell about this book and who um both of yours work is like it's just, I don't know there's just something about the way yeah I could go on and on but she had said it and I was like okay somebody said it so I can say it now um without boasting but it became my intention to really highlight mm -hmm. what happens to a lot of people who are in these not just indigenous people but who are raised in spaces and forced to leave for political mm -hmm. reasons even if it's their homeland in the heart yet not genetically or you know familially right mm -hmm. and so I shaped the book in that way and it's you know fire exit I guess people ask me how did you come up with the title I don't know but for me it's become this like oh there's a fire so what do we do exit like let's yeah. all get out of that social you know system we're in and examine it and the book the book gives the reader very little you know it, as somebody once said it's not recliner reading you know it really demands your attention but yeah the that was really the intention was to get people to kind of think about the actual power they have if they step outside and they look at the whole system and what we could collectively do because individually you know it's this first person narrator all the way through yeah. who's not native talking about native people but is native in a way it's like they can't do he you know individually can't do anything but collectively we we can yeah, bring about absolutely. change Absolutely. And thank you so much for such a, a nuanced response to that question, because it is so layered. You know, you talk about what Native women go through. And um, for me, this is something that's always needed to be highlighted. You know, the violence that they experience, the fact that the media pays no attention whatsoever. Um, and it's utterly devastating. So I think to kind of use these different lenses to highlight that but also look at it from a slightly outsider perspective because that's what Charles is like you said you know he's a white man who is not of that culture but in a way also is because he's grown up he's grown up there um he's close to these people he's fallen in love with a young woman who he had a child with and he's kind of in a very painful position I think when we meet him at the beginning of the novel because he's at this juncture where he's you know, he's looking after his mother who's struggling with mental illness, Alzheimer's, and he's watching Elizabeth grow up from this distance and dying to tell her about, you know, her full inheritance. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's so cleverly done because it is looking at all these perspectives, but it is also so intimate because we're accessing all of this through Charles. Um, and that's, you know, it's a it's a high wire act as a writer. <laughs> I'm kind of in awe and admiration that you were able to pull this off, how you've done this. Um, and I wondered whether there were, you mentioned one or two books that you referenced, you know, when you were kind of exploring this idea and I love that you said, actually, the first draft, I just completely wanted to be free. And you're, you know, you're, you're led by the characters, you're kind of, you're led by the idea. And maybe you're, you're asking yourself one or two questions, but not loads, because you don't want to get weighed down and feel like it's too prescriptive. So, you know, you kind of articulated that so beautifully. So yeah, I, I wanted to just drill down a bit more about when you had this idea, um, were you, A, were you frightened to write it uh, for any reason? And, and B, what were the references that you looked at to kind of give you that permission? You know, when often when we're tackling things, I know for myself, uh, you know, you can feel scared to write something, but I always get permission from people like Toni Morrison and um, James Baldwin, um, you know, and Jamaica Kinsid and all these amazing writers. And then I read it and I go, Oh, I don't know how they did that, but I'm going to make an attempt myself. 
Yeah, I th- I have just on a bookshelf over here, I have like a, just some. I'm like, these are required readings if you want to be a writer. And all three mm-hmm. that you listed were writers that like I have right there. Toni Morrison, James Baldwin. I don't have Jamaica Kincaid, but I have like her stuff on PDFs and everything. Yeah, but, like, she's great. Be- uh, I mean, yeah, it's like, so actually it should be titled, I think better better titled how you said it, you know, how to give yourself permission to write what you're not supposed to in a way, you know? Yeah, Um, Yeah, definitely, definitely, because that's what happens. And I think actually for me, there has to be an element of fear, whatever project I'm working on, um, and an element, you know, we're led by curiosity as writers, aren't we? We're not, I don't go into it with the answers. I never do. And actually Mm -hmm. that would be so boring to say, oh, okay, here's what we, here's what we do. Here's exactly what we do. We we, we don't know, but we can have a conversation. And I love that you said, well, okay, Charles doesn't have the answers, but actually, you know, he's like a conduit to think about what we can do as a collective. Here are some of the things that we can think about in ways that we respond to some of these issues that, you know, Native Americans face and we can have a dialogue about it. And actually it's really important to highlight that because that's how we get solutions. So I love that you framed it in that way. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for the question. I mean, it was a great one to really talk about the book practically but also like theoretically you know yeah, it was yeah. just a hard thing to do so no it's it's a it's a juggernaut of a novel um and you know we touched on this earlier but it examines things of a of abandonment of father-daughter relationships of abuse of alcoholism physical violence I mean these are all heavy subject matters but what's fascinating about how you've explored this is you do it with a deafness you know, with a certain dexterity and a kind of lightness of touch. And I'm so curious about whether or not you were consciously doing that, you know, or if that just came about during the writing process that obviously you wanted to look at these themes, but you didn't want to be too heavy handed about it, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, the first mentor I ever had as a writer you know because I I barely graduated high school and it's funny you know I got I was rejected by the University of Maine Orono as a student but now I teach there as a professor which is how dare they (laughs) I know right (laughs) Um, I just I just I love that story so I went to Eastern Maine Community College which is just in Bangor and it falls under the same umbrella as like the UMaine system um And it was there who I met a professor who mostly taught online, but I swear he's like, he's just, he's a great writer, but he's a brilliant reader and teacher Mm -hmm. and editor. And um, I remember very early on in our work, you know, he was, I was doing things, I was writing more abstractly than, uh, literally right with objects and specificity and he was like he's like don't he's like he's like don't explain yourself he's like Mm. you do not need to explain these things he's like leave that to the readers to the critics to the reviewers and so I've always held firm to I suppose that western kind of like Mm. thinking of like no ideas, but in things, you know, quote, kind of like, let's, let's imbue the objects, let's imbue the setting and harmonize, you know, the voice, the point of view, the character, the plot, um, and the the setting, right? Like into one sort of specific orchestra of its own logic. And to do that, it's hard, you know, like to, to get that right. And I mean, the book that exists now is the sixth rewrite of it. So I had five others that I just scrapped. Wow. And yeah, and I mean, like, I have memories that are not in this book, but are in earlier drafts where we're in Mary's point, limited point of view, mm-hmm. third person. And when this book first came out in the US, I had forgotten what it was like. I had to reread the book because it had been <laughs> so long since I looked at it. But I knew what it was like saying and stuff. But mm-hmm people would say things and I'd be like that happened I didn't know you know because uh (laughs) yeah but no it's 
it's difficult. I don't know. I think it's, that's just how I work is like to get to where I need to go. It's a constant. The metaphor I use is, you know, you know, each page is just a mile on the odometer towards the city where the story is going to happen, except in this metaphor, there's no carbon emissions or anything and like stuff like that. So that's such a cool way. I've never heard anybody describe the process like that. That is that is such a cool way of describing it. And I will be referring to that when I rewatch this recording. So thank you very much for that. Um, and on that note. It would be great to hear an excerpt um, from the novel if you're open to doing that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I could start with just the very beginning. I think yeah. it might be worthwhile. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this is the opening. So this is chapter one. Um, I wanted the girl to know the truth. I wanted her to know who I was, who I really was, instead of a white man who had lived across from her all her life and watched her grow up from this side of the river. It was late spring. I sat outside drinking coffee and not smoking because my lighter had run out of gas. Fog rolled off the water that divided the Penobscot Nation from the rest of the state of Maine. I was waiting, as I usually did. Soon, Across the river and on the reservation, my girl, a woman by that point, came out of the house and got in her car to go to work. I didn't know how many times I'd been through this same routine, but that morning, something took hold of me. Something was different this time. She started her car and backed out of the driveway, and then, as usual, she was out of sight. I got up and drank the rest of my coffee and thought about calling Louise, my mother, but decided she was probably sleeping. So I went inside to make breakfast, not because I was hungry, but because I needed something to do so I could think about what had come over me. Maybe the change had come about because I'd stopped working in the woods so much and had more time to think. But the fact was that I'd gone along for too long with Mary's plan to lie and say that the girl was another man's and enrolled Native man's so that she, our daughter, could be on the census, Mary's Penobscot blood plus Rogers, giving Elizabeth exactly what she needed to be enrolled. But that morning, I wanted our daughter to know the truth. I was tired of holding that secret. I was going to make eggs and some seasoned hash and think about all this, but when I cut up the washed potato, I nicked the tip of my thumb real good with the knife and got blood all over my hand and said, forget it. I went to the couch and sat down and I wrapped a paper towel around my thumb and watched the blood seep through and then there was no denying what I wanted. I did want the truth to be known. The blood that came out of me was blood that ran through her veins. It's strange. All blood looks the same, yet it's different we're told, in so many various ways and for so many various reasons. But one thing is for certain, I thought, you are who you are, even if you don't know it. Thank Brilliant. You. Thank you so much for that gorgeous reading. I mean, yeah, I imagine when you read from the book or if you read that episode, you can hear a pin drop because it is so crystallized, you know, the sense of carrying this secret um, you know, the weight of it and wanting to make change and that something happens to Charles that morning where he cannot take it anymore. You know, he feels like he cannot um, carry it in the way that he has done. Um, and I just love that that reading emphasizes that so, so beautifully. So thank you for that. Um, I want to I want to pivot now somewhat to talk a little bit about Night of the Living Res, um, which was a best-selling, critically acclaimed um, collection of short stories. And in fact, that's how I first heard of you, because even in the UK, there was so much buzz about this amazing collection. And I have a real interest in the voices of, you know, writers of colour um, across the board. So I was like, wow, this sounds incredible. Um, and it's very hard <laughs> to have that happen for a short story collection. So honestly, I take my hat off to you. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm curious, after that happened, you know, writing this novel, did it feel kind of more expansive in its own way? Um, and how do you see it sort of sitting within your body of work? Because you kind of have several feathers to your to your bow, really, I think, when you're able to 
write short stories um, and a novel. I, I don't think people realize the work that goes into a short story collection. I mean, you're carrying worlds upon worlds and like endless characters. Uh, in some ways, it can be even harder than a novel, I think. Um, so I'm just, I'm really curious about your perspective on that. Yeah, I think, I suppose my, I guess, you know, like growing up, I was, I always like, I was always fascinated by telling stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like looking back, me and my friends, you know, when, you know, 13 and up, you know, if we were stealing cigarettes, or, you know, drinking beer in the wood, you know, those, you know, as we grew up, I was kind of the person who kind of held on to everything that had happened <laughs> to us or like to people. And so I always, I don't know, I, I, any one of my friends could probably come forth and be like, you're a liar. But um, <laughs> I feel like I was always like, like I held our stories and was the one mm. who kind of like would let them out. And so like with that, I mean, like I didn't do well in high school. Like I didn't, you know, when I went to college and I like read a book, like actually like read it, you know, I was like, wait, this is kind of the same thing that I love or mm. like have always done in my life, you know? Mm. Um, and I was like, oh, it's just a different medium. It's a different form. Yeah. And so fast forward to today, I kind of like, I, I see story as being like, like, like we've created genres, we've created all of these things, you know, my perspective is like, if we take human life off of the planet, and we're just an omnipresent thing looking down, and there's just earth with like animals, like, story still exists, like, yeah. but just in a very quiet way, right, you know, two squirrels are fighting over what they want in acorn there's a setting <laughs> a nor'easter is coming up new england right you know a beaver is cutting down a tree unknowingly or knowingly who knows that has a bird's nest in it that has its babies and it crashes right and you know so there's drama without mm. us even on this earth even though it's quiet drama and then the unfortunate thing is, is we came along um <laughs> Um, and you know, we found story or it kind of let us see it. And yeah. so I've always seen it as a different entity. So as a writer, you know, with the, and I'm still figuring this stuff out, but like writing the novel was in a way kind of like writing the short story collection, mm -hmm. but the short story collection was more of like, uh, like a 500 meter dash yeah. you know with every story um and then the novel though was more of like a race you signed up for that didn't tell you when it ended <laughs> you know <laughs> and which is like yeah. scary but at the same time like you know, the race that doesn't end is the same as like the 500 meter metaphor in that you don't know how many 500 meter dashes you're going to have to do until right. you get it done. So it's like, I've just have get genre out of my mind. Mm -hmm. I I, I, I kind of get sick of the type of stories, not stories, but novels that follow that nice arc that they're supposed to. And like, yeah. I, I, I try to give into it a little bit but take some of it away intentionally because I want us to move away from um, being stagnant in what we're reading and how we're reading um, yeah. because there's a danger in that, you know, if we're reading the same way all the time, it's like, are we moving forward in any sort of capacity? You know, are we, yeah. you know, are we should we keep asking questions that are as artists or should we answer them you know like mm -hmm. like it, it it's just an interesting thing i think about so between the two they were both a lot of work um yeah. and i think this one was much harder than the story collection the story collection i think was kind to me in that <laughs> it was like yeah, short stories are undervalued, so I'll give you a little help, you know, or something like oh, that. Oh, I love that. I love that you did that, you know, because yeah. it is it is similarly, um, and I really love your description, it is a very feverish process for me when I'm writing it. It's If I'm writing short stories, I'm just like, I'm consumed by it, and it is a dash. You're like, 
while it's in my blood, while it's in my marrow, I need to get this out, you know, whereas with the novel, I always describe it as being on a, like a little boat at sea, you know, you have the kind of excitement, then you get to the middle and you're like, oh my God, how am I getting to the end of this trip? And how am I going to connect all the dots? And what did I, what was my intention with this book again? You know, and, and I love that you said that, you know, between the short story and the novel form, you do kind of reconfigure your approaches to fiction. Um, you know, even when you talked about carrying stories as a kid, you know, amongst your friends, that's so great because there's always one friend who's like the archivist, essentially, you know, who who is the person that's remembering everything and kind of, you know, storing everything, but not necessarily thinking about the ways that they're doing it. It's just there, you know, you just find that you can kind of tap into it. And isn't that the beauty of storytelling that it is like, you know, whatever ancestry or background you look into, there is this kind of griot style absorption of stories traveling and moving between humans that's you know such a great way of of looking at it and also you know like you said not reading in prescriptive ways you know I always like to make I mean I'm a bit meaner than you you're lovely but I always like to make my readers quite uncomfortable because I just think you know, I just think the reading process should engage people in different ways. And I, you really hit the nail on the head about getting into a kind of typical way of that. And 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 that authors need to think about pushing their readers more. And, and actually, the readers get so much more out of it. You know, you can't read a book like Fire Exit and come out of it feeling the same way. You just can't. You know, and I think that's what's so brilliant about what you were saying. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, oh. I, I I do need to be meaner in a way, <laughs> in, in, in the way that I know you're talking about, like, um, in like a transgressive form, you know, there's like, a, I just think about like your use, like your use in your own work about like, not staying in the realistic world, right, mm -hmm. but using mm -hmm. the imaginary. And yeah. Um, yeah, I have been working on stories actually like that. Um, amazing amazing yeah, so yeah so and I am, also, I'm but I do, I do but I also do think you know that 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 weight of emotionality to anchor the stories is really important too you know I I, I read Raymond Carver stories and I'm blown away I love his work I can't do that I just can't write a straight story to save my life but I love that that Carver does it you know and I get loads out of it do you know what I mean and the stories yeah. are devastating they are they're you know they're brilliantly crafted um so I just think it, it, you're in such a great position in that you you kind of move between the two so well and I know in America there is a there's a lot of value for short stories in the sense that there are much there are there are many more outlets that publish yeah. short stories than in the UK I mean in the UK a, an agent will tell you if you say oh I have a collection they'll say uh what about a novel? <laughs> That's that that is also the same thing here. Interestingly enough, it's it, it's weird because here it's like you're told, okay, publish short stories and then you'll be able to get an agent and then you could get like, you know, can put it together. And then you do all of that, and then they're like, Well, do you have a novel? They say <laughs> that, right? Yeah. And even if you have a novel and then they go to publish your story collection, at least this happened at, at Tin House, they're like, okay, do you have any other stories we could put in here? Oh. And it wasn't a malicious thing. I think it was because a lot of them had been published already, you yeah. know? So it's just weird. The whole, the business side of art is a very strange thing. But with indie yeah. presses, I like is that they, they're, they are businessy, but mm. they're mm. like very advocate. They advocate for, they're ad, advocates for artists, you know, more oh. so than I think bigger 100%. places. 100%. And they are publishing incredible voices and taking big risks. I mean, and other stories is just phenomenal. Um, as you know, you know, the staple of writers and they publish with such care and love, you know, um, and wanting to kind of be true to the artist's voice, to the writer's voice, you know. So I feel like in some ways it's almost kind of collaborative with them you know I, I wasn't published by them um you know but I've always admired the writers that they've published and the the amazing work that they've done so I think this is such a fantastic a publisher for you 
um you know in, in the uk you're in you're in great hands with them yeah i know with somebody i think it was when they when we sold that uh there was somebody had said they're like the tin house of the yeah. uk or whatever and i was like all right we're going with them you know, that, <laughs> let's go was, with them <laughs> yeah that's immediately amazing. my reaction amazing um i want to go back to your voice actually as an as an author well for this book i would say um the, I, I love the intensity the kind of profound quiet power your writing has you know it's really special um i'm just curious to as to how you came to your authorial voice. I'm always fascinated by this with writers and, you know, what kind of goes into the makeup of that. Um, it's it's so tautly written, but it's, it's really evocative um, and it has this emotional depth and nuance to it. You know, how not a word is wasted, not one word on the page is wasted. You know, how did you, there's real assurance there. There's real confidence there as a writer. Um, you know, how did you come to that? How did you find that authorial voice? Because it can take a while, you know, for, for a writer to really have a sense of themselves and their style and, and how that comes across on the page. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it was, it had a lot to do with working with, editors at like literary magazines mm. you know you know I started writing when I was 18 and um yeah I started writing when I was 18 I mean I didn't become like serious serious about it until mm. you know I was 24 25 but if we think 18 how old am I 10 so it's like I don't know 14 years worth of mm. writing you know that I put into practice but even when I started writing bad work, I was like buying the writer's marketplace book, which was like that big in the U S and like, you'd mm -hmm. like look through and I'd be sending it to the ones that had like the five figure dollar symbols, you know, next to it on what they paid yeah. and putting them in the mail. But like when I did start to get, you know, nibbles here and there from editors who would give me a little bit of feedback. Right. Um, and and then eventually getting stories accepted into magazines, working with, you know, editors who understand it as art, right? Because mm. I think the literary magazine kind of scene, besides the top tier ones, are much more like about the art yeah. of it than uh, because they don't make any money. I mean, like they're they make money as I'm thinking of like the Georgia Review, for example, mm -hmm. like like they who work there are paid for what they do, but not like in a huge capacity. But like, I worked with an editor for The Name Means Thunder, which is a Night of the Living Res. And um, there was a moment in that where I had a very long, drawn out, sent like Cormac McCarthy-esque, you know, <laughs> one sentence thing. And he said to me, you know, he was like, he was like, this works. He's like, but you want to consider something. He was like, do you want your reader to pay more attention to your style or do you mm -hmm. want your reader to pay more attention to the story that's happening? Right, right. So it's like you begin to develop a sensitivity of when you should do something over the other and you don't always get it right and that's what editors are for because they have that or, or a good reader you have, you know, like that's what they're so beneficial for is like being able to be like, I think you're kind of making the reader look at the wrong thing. Mm. And so those types of like learning experiences, um, which I always try to put and share with my own, with, with writers in my classes at the university or, you know, workshops I do elsewhere, to develop voices to be vulnerable to the fact that what you're doing isn't always going to be the thing that is going to work like you're not going to get it the way you want it to be all the time i right. think some geniuses can i think you know um, well i think even the geniuses sometimes you know sometimes, like yeah. you said yeah don't yeah. get it right but no that's such a yeah a good way of framing it actually uh the right editor should elevate your work you know that's what yeah. you want and and should strike that balance between you know style and and the story moving forward which like yeah. you said you know it doesn't always happen exactly but hopefully you get it within a story 70 percent yep. of the time or yeah. you know there's got to be room for 
for for flexibility in that sense. But um, it would be great to hear a second excerpt from yeah. Choir Exit on that note. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we have, um, so I opened with the opening pages and I'll read, um, I'll read from later in the book. So this is around the 200 page mark, actually. Um, and uh, the the final line is actually one of the titles, like, I almost titled the book this. This is the second, this came in second place. But um, so this is coming up on, you know, the, top, the, the, the key to the book, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And Charles is, has um, left his mom, who he was staying the night with, um, because there has there was a winter storm coming and yeah. um he's trying to go and check um to to make sure that something um to make sure I don't want to give any spoilers but to make sure um his daughter was okay or you know because he hadn't been mm -hmm. seeing her where he, he had normally would in the mornings in the opening of the book right in that capacity yeah. so he hadn't seen her for a while um and then something he heard elicited a response that evening. Um, and uh, so he's driving all the way back to the reservation. Um, and this passage reads, um, Nobody would have known people were out searching for a missing person. The streets were empty, both in Overtown and on the reservation. After I crossed the bridge to the reservation, I parked in the church parking lot and rolled my window down. There was the sound of falling snow, the noise outside, not unlike pressure in the ear, but without the discomfort. I thought I heard a plow approaching, the metal scraping the road, but no vehicle passed by. I waited in the church parking lot for I don't know how long, and I didn't quite know what I was waiting for. A sign something more to push me to Mary's house. The feeling to act had disappeared. Reason had come back to me. My plan had been to go to Mary's, but now that I was so close, I was second guessing. This is silly, that's what I thought. It was silly to think what I had thought, to hurry as I had and ask the neighbor to watch my mother while I chased after something I thought was falling apart. But that had been my life. A pursuit of only remains. Wonderful. So here, you know, he had seen on the television that yeah. there was a woman missing and he thought it was his daughter, and, you know, so he's going out. Um, and a complete juxtaposition, I think, to the opening where we get a lot of inaction. Yeah. Versus yeah. him finally doing something. Yeah, um, you really feel that sense of action in that in that passage. So, yeah. And uh, a sense of like expectation <laughs> as yeah. well, you know, yeah, which is which propels him to to act further. So, no, thank you, thank you very much for that. I have two last questions for you. Um, unfortunately, I say, <laughs> um, I'm curious as to how the state of the world right now is impacting you as a writer. You know, there are a lot of terrible things going on, um, and writers are sensitive people. I know that I I look at things and I some days I just think oh my god this is so difficult but there's also a lot of joy in the world as well and and finding those pockets of joy as an artist to sustain you whether it's community or helping to amplify other voices you know um what are the areas you feel that you're exploring now that that make you reflective about process um and that kind of keep you going if that makes sense I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of awful stuff going on that has kind of actually made me pull myself away from projects that are approaching the issues mm. only in so far as not because I don't want to be part of it, but because as an indigenous person, there are these particular strange parallels. I'm thinking of obviously Gaza and Palestine, mm. all of that. And yeah you know um you know my knowledge of and history of that isn't as solidified as my understanding of you know federal indian law and policy and the shaping of the us yeah there's a connection between the two but there's something 
they're each unique you know yeah. they're they're all obviously from a colonial reason why it exists right but like i like for that you know i've i'm like trying to figure out how to write about it how to talk about it um yeah. but for the joy aspect, you know, that brings me kind of back into play, you know, I think has a lot to do with, you know, my son, um, you know, thinking about, you know, well, playing with my son and just being a child like him, you know, at the, you know, and, 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 and getting and feeling and knowing that to him, none of this stuff is occurring, right. Mm -hmm. And it's liberating. Um, but it's also sad when you step outside of it. But it's that yeah. sadness, for me at least, that turns into an irritation and anger, right? That, you know, gets me wanting to do something to bring about change. And mm -hmm. so um, lately I've been working a lot on um, a, uh, a business that I feel is going to do a lot of good for writers um, in the U in in the U.S., but hopefully globally eventually one day if that ever takes off. So I've been yeah. I've been doing that a lot, um, and um, yeah, I think just really being with my wife and my son and teaching and reading, um, yeah. and then facing head on the issues and then going back, you know, retreating. It's kind of this like yeah I behind a tree it's like Emily Dickinson like I always think of her <laughs> m her m dashes as like her like peeking out real quick and then going away like that's yeah. what I feel like I'm living in an m dash kind of like life right, right. now um right. but that's where I'm finding joy is like in the process of doing that um being with family and then stepping out into the world um where there is just where it is a mess where it yeah. is an absolute yeah. absolute mess everywhere even if we don't know it, you know. Oh, 100%. And that familial space is so important, like you said, you know, raising a little one. I mean, what could be more important than that, you know? And exactly. also it just puts things into perspective, I feel, you know, uh, you know, raising a child and, and seeing how they look at the world, you know, through that, like you said, those childlike eyes. It's so liberating and so authentic <laughs> you know and so stripped of the nonsense that it, it, it kind of grounds you as well as I think it reconnects you like you said with the element of play and bringing play into other areas in our lives you know thinking about the writing process as play um, I think can be very helpful to some writers and um, I'm very intrigued by this endeavor that you've mentioned um, that you're kind of working on for writers so uh, I'm going to look out for that because yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hit you I'll hit you up about it yeah please do you putting my hand up here already to say yeah I, I want to I want to know about that and I want to engage with that um but lastly I want to talk about the process of writing this book um and the fact that you know you go through a lot when you work on a novel how have you transformed in yourself whilst writing this book um you know and what are the takeaways you want readers to leave with after reading it because it's 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 really a powerful poignant piece of work um that i think speaks to some really um important issues um but i'm curious you know you can't write a work like this and not be affected and not be changed somewhat internally so i was curious about that yeah i think you know for me you know i i learned um I'm the type of person who always reads reviews. Like I just like reading. I love reading reviews because some yeah. people are really funny and clever with yeah. their like reviews. Um, and I used to, I got in trouble with Goodreads because I commented <laughs> on a couple. I just did because they were like, they were, they were, they were, they were, I had a funny response to them and yeah. I had conversations with one person, you know, and all sorts of stuff. But like, Anyways, all that besides, I found that a lot of people didn't quite understand what they'd read. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with their lack of understanding about like blood quantum, right? Because the book doesn't really give you, it doesn't tell you, like it, it, it demands that you kind of be like, well, wait, let me go look and like, yeah. what is this book, you know, doing? 
Because to do that work then helps situate you in the story. Absolutely. It puts you not in conversation with, you know, a story. It puts you in, that's fit labeled fiction, but it puts you in conversation with the actual real life implications of mm. the thing, right? And so I learned as a writer that I ain't going to give you what you want. You know, like I'm like, I'm <laughs> just not. That. Yeah, like, I'm gonna if I'm not gonna again, like my first mentor ever, like, I'm not gonna explain to you, you know, like, it's not, you know, as an indigenous person, and you know, this too, right? Like, yeah. art, like, you know, a white readership usually expects us to explain. Yeah, things, yeah. and it's like, I'm just not like, yeah, I'm no, you do, do the it. work, you absolutely yeah. go and do that extra work. And, yeah. you know, I am here to kind of introduce you to this world and hopefully yeah. like plant some things that should spark that interest you know yeah yeah absolutely the other side too is that you can do that while still writing a book I think that is you can read without the context mm -hmm. it just might not be for people right yeah. like yeah. I always build my work upon emotion like that's the foundation because that's the one thing that we all share, you know, despite cultural, like the one thing that transcends every boundary is the fact that we can all feel. Yeah. So that sort of, you know, also added. Yeah. What keeps you, what are the takeaways you want readers to leave with? Yeah. Um, one is kind of what I just said a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the other is, you know, we all don't know who we are, yeah. you know, that's, I think one of the, terrible things about um the way the world has expanded and the way places have transformed due to colonialism due mm. to power and due to money you know all of these things due to um philosophy that is the guiding philosophy mm. or ideologies um and it's like talk to your family right you know like ask these questions like I regret not asking my mother more questions I regret at not asking my father more questions and knowing more about them and their stories and because it's like you know there's a line I think in here where Charles says something it's like you know you can't really be a full person unless you know all the stories that belong to you and I think about people who, you know, say are adopted, for example, and like, they don't know that genetically, like they have, they may have some specific trauma in mm. them, right? That mm. is leading them that way. But I also respect the opposite side where it's like some people don't want to know it. Mm. And mm. it's like your choice, right? Like you have the choices in life to do and act. So I want this book to leave people with that idea is that you have a choice. Neither is incorrect and neither is right at the same time. Yeah. But hopefully whichever you choose is somehow, or not hopefully, is contributing, I think, to the goodness of kind mm -hmm. of not restoring, but finding a better way forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that. What a fantastic response to the question and, and huge thanks to you for this conversation. It's been so enriching and insightful and intelligent in all the ways I expected, but even surpassed that. Um, I could actually talk to you legitimately for hours. But yeah, I know, we can keep going, yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> exactly. But I know we have to stop. But no, Fire Exit is is here this is my copy um published by Anne Lover Stories out in October um I highly recommend it it's an amazing work and I honestly cannot wait to see what you put out next I'm a huge fan um so I'm just looking to you know looking forward to more more amazing work from you so thank you so much Morgan and thank you so much very very much this was a great pleasure to talk to you.